Hi, this is National Master Dan Heisman, and we're continuing with our series of YouTube videos on how to improve your chess. Some of my best watched videos in terms of number of people uh, watching them is the ones on thought process. So I thought I'd do one today on kind of why there is not one thought process. People are always bugging me and saying, yeah, yeah, I know that good players don't have a list, they don't have a checklist, but I'm a beginner, I need a checklist, and then later on maybe it'll become subconscious. And I say, okay, if that'll help you, I'll give you sort of a checklist. And we talked about this in my earlier video called Thought Process, Five Essential Steps. But in the long run, you really don't want to have a process. You want to be able to look at the board and figure out what you need to do. It's sort of like walking down the street. You don't want to have a process for walking down the street. You don't want to say, okay, once I move my knee this way on this foot, and then I put my foot down, I want to move my other foot in this way. You don't want to really think of it that way. You want to just be able to kind of do it based on what's happening. If you're walking uphill, you do it a little differently. If you're walking downhill, you do it a little differently. If you're walking up steps, you do it a little differently. But you don't sit there and go, I need my walking up step process. Now, you do have one in your brain, but it's not very conscious. So let's take a look at some of these things. <clears throat> let's say you're black and white opens up the game A3. I'll flip the board here on my ICC board. <clears throat> let's say you're not a very good player and you don't know hardly anything about openings. And of course, if you're even if you're a good player, you probably don't have a big book on A3. But let's say you don't know a lot about openings, but you do know some opening principles. And someone plays A3. Well, what's your process here to find a move for black? Well, your process should be, all right, what did they tell me I need to do in the opening? They said, I need to get out my pieces. I need to control the center. I need to castle my king. So I want some moves that can do that. And if your process is a decent process, you're not just going to pick one. You're going to look at your candidate moves. And you're going to say, what are all the moves I could play that would make sense? And then you're going to try to compare them. So here, if you don't know anything about openings, <clears throat> you're going to look at moves like d5 to grab the center. You're going to look at moves like e5. You're going to look at moves like knight f6. You might even look at a move like knight to c6. And you're going to say, these are all candidate moves. Which one would I like to play? And let's say you decide you want to castle kingside, and you'd like to get out your king bishop first. So therefore, you decide through that process that e5 is the move that you want to play. You, you can see that it's safe. He's not attacking any of these squares. And you just play e5, and that's a very good process. <clears throat> now let's say you're a better player, and you know a fair amount about openings, and someone plays a3 against you. Now you might have a slightly different process. Instead of just saying, I'd like to play e5, what you're going to say is, well, white has basically passed here. And what he's basically saying is, I will let you be white, even though you're black. I will let you be the white pieces, but I'm going to have this extra move a3. So for instance, you might think to yourself, okay, if I were white, and let's flip the board back to white, I like to play the Roy Lopez, e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6, bishop to b5. But now that I'm black and white has played a3, is it going to be possible for me to play a Roy Lopez? <clears throat> Can I play e5, e4, knight f6, knight c3, and then bishop to b4 with a, a reversed Roy Lopez? And the answer is no, I can't do that. That pawn on a3 is going to stop me. So if I play e5 with the idea of playing a reversed Roy Lopez, it's not going to work. I could play a reversed Italian game. Now he could attack me with b4. I wonder if that would be worth trying to play for. This is all going through a better player's mind when white plays a3. Now their process isn't just to follow principles, but it's to find a reverse opening where a3 doesn't help white or maybe even hurts white. They're trying to say, if I play a queen's gambit, you know, is a3 helpful for white? If I play a Roy Lopez, if I play a reversed, uh, you know, Benoni, if I play... Uh, what kind of reversed openings can I play? For instance, suppose you play in English, a reversed English with c4, c5. Does a3 help white? And the answer is yes. In a, in a symmetric English, a3 helps get in the break move b4. So maybe playing a reversed English 
isn't the best idea for black. Maybe he should aim for some sort of other opening. But your process now is different. Instead of just following principles, you're trying to, through your process, to figure out what reversed opening can I play that would make sense where A3 is not going to help white that much. And that's basically going to be your process. You're using your knowledge, and then you're using your analytical ability to throw in that extra A3 from your opening knowledge to figure out whether or not that's going to be helpful for white. And if it's not, then maybe that's an opening that you can pick to play in reverse here for black after they play A3. Okay, let's compare that process with a process you might use in a clear endgame position. Let's uh, flip the board again so white's on the bottom. And let's clear out the board. And we'll put a king on b1 and a king on c3 and a pawn on h2. And it's white's move here. Okay, so what's my process for finding a move? Well, the first thing I notice is this is a rook pawn endgame. I use my knowledge and I say... If the black king gets to h8 without me getting a queen, this is just a draw. So I ask myself, what should I do here? Well, suppose I just try to bring my king over and guard my pawn with king to c1. And now clearly he can't win the pawn because I can get there in the same amount of moves. But suppose black abandons the idea of getting the pawn and just heads his king back to the corner. Well, my knowledge tells me that this is going to be a draw. So therefore, my knowledge tells me here that playing king to c1 is possible to guard my pawn. I can use analysis to figure that out. But my process in using analysis tells me that if my opponent just knows to put the king in the corner, that this won't help me very much. So what it tells me is that this is basically a race between my h-pawn and his king which means I should just try to push my h-pawn two moves and see if his king can catch me before I become a queen. So here I use a different piece of knowledge. I say, all right, let's say I analyze the position. When should I use the, the, what's called the rule of the square where I have to see if the black king can get inside the square? And my knowledge tells me I have to use that rule after the pawn moves and before the king moves. So I would, in my mind, I would look at the move h4 and I would draw a box and I would say, can the black king get inside that box? If he can, then it's a draw. And if he can't, then I win. Here, with the pawn on h2, if I play h4 in my mind and I imagine that position, I visualize it, and I see that he can play king to d4, then I see he can get inside the box, and it's going to be a draw. But that tells me, if I use my first plan, which is to play king c1 and guard my pawn, it's a draw. And if I try to race with him, it's also a draw, and since in both cases it's a draw, this if black knows what he's doing here, which is not that hard, this game is going to be a draw. I can't win the game anymore. So my process has led me to believe that whether I play king c1 or I play h4, black's going to figure out how to draw the position. I could continue my process and say, okay, um, which one is the harder draw for black? Uh, before I decide to play king c1 or h4, I'm going to figure out which one is he more likely to go wrong on? And I'm going to pick the one where he's more likely to go wrong. Okay, so now we had used a completely different process in this very deterministic endgame compared to the process that we used in the opening after A3. The process is completely different. There are some of those essential elements that we looked at in the other video, but everything is very clear, and having... A specific process, like let's say the first thing I'm going to do is look for all my checks, captures, and threats. So the first thing I'm going to do is uh, determine whether my opponent's move is safe. Or the first thing I'm going to do is look for all my opponent's threats based on his last move. Well, these are all good things to do, and in most normal positions you might do them. But in the two positions we looked at, a good process might kind of skip over those things because they're relatively irrelevant in positions like that. Now let's take a more normal game. Let's uh, look at a game I played against uh, Master Jean Pommeljans many years ago. I think it's number 261 in my library. <clears throat> Examine percent 261. Okay, Heisman Pommeljans. All right, let's go up to move uh, 21. Let's. It was a Roy Lopez. We actually transposed from a modern Steinitz here 
into the main line of the closed Roy Lopez. So this is the Tabia. In my very first video, uh, I talk about thought process. In my second video, I talk about learning opening lines and ideas. I think it was the second one. And I use this closed Roy Lopez as an example. So if you don't know how to get to this position or why, you can go back to that video on learning opening lines and ideas and with the example of the closed Roy Lopez. So we got to this standard Tabia position. And black played the old classical knight a5, bishop c2, c5, d4, queen c2, knight bd2. And now black has several standard moves that he could play here. He can play bishop d7, he can play bishop b7, he can play knight c6, he could even take the pawn. He plays the unusual move g6. So I'm out of my book here, and I know the normal idea is to play knight f1, so I go ahead and do that. And now he plays the interesting move, knight h5. Here Stockfish says I should have played bishop h6 followed by knight e3. I played knight e3 right away. He played bishop e6. I went after the bishop pair, which turns out to be the wrong strategy. He takes the pawn, and he decides to double and isolate my d-pawns with c4, giving him a three-on-two majority and giving me doubled isolated pawns, but leaving my bishops open to attack the king side and my pawns on d4 and d5 to control central squares. So they're vulnerable, but if I don't lose them, then they can be pretty strong. So I played knight g5. I don't think the computer thinks that's the best move. And he plays knight g7, and I play queen f3. He plays rook ae8. I play bishop d2, hitting the knight that's a little off sides on a5. He plays knight back to b7. Notice my pawn on d4 is doing a good job of keeping that knight out of the game. So let's take a look at this position for a minute. Okay, so if I had a process here, what could my process be? Well, this is a little more normal than the first two positions we looked at. <clears throat> so the first thing I might ask is, is my opponent's last move knight to b7 safe? Well, asking if it's safe doesn't mean if I can take off the knight on b7. It means do I have a, some sort of combination anywhere on the board that would win material or checkmate? For instance, could I start attacking f7 with my knight and my queen and another piece and maybe get something? Or can I play rook takes e7, sacrifice the exchange, and try to go after something? Or maybe I can get my queen to the h-file and try to take off his h-pawn. <clears throat> These are all ideas that might make his move not safe. Then I have to ask, what are all the things that knight b8 does? No, sorry, knight b7. Well, one thing it does is it gets the knight off of the a5 square so the queen doesn't have to sit there and watch it. <clears throat> that's very important. The queen doesn't want to sit there and watch the knight. But that's not the only thing it does. If I don't keep the pawn on d4, his knight can get back to c5. His knight can go to d8 and try to guard that f7 square. What else could he do? Well, he could move his queen now to a5 because his knight's not there, but my bishop's guarding that square. He can move his pawn to a5 on the next move. That's a move he could play that knight b7 allows. <coughs> so my process right here is asking whether or not, you know, what all things his move does. But is that my entire process? No. Now I have to look at what I'm trying to do and what are my candidate moves. Well, one of the things I'm trying to do here is get this rook on a8, a1 into the game. I could play rook up on the, along the e file and then get the other rook on the open file that's a major idea of what i'm trying to do so some of my candidate moves might be rook to e2 or rook to e3 or rook to e4 <clears throat> what else am i trying to do well if i'm trying to attack the king side maybe i need some pawns to help him maybe i can play g4 or h4 or maybe i can move my queen to the g file and get my queen up to h4 I have a lot of candidates' ideas here. So I have to kind of figure out what it is that I'm trying to do. So my process here is, you know, what is Black trying to do? Am I trying to stop him? Is it dangerous? Is it going to happen right away? What am I trying to do? Once I figure out what I'm trying to do, I have to figure out what are my reasonable candidate moves. You know, do I want to activate that rook on a1 by playing a4 and trying to break up his pawns? Am I trying to attack on the king side? If I'm trying to attack on the king side, what moves do I want to play that might lead there? Notice there's not a lot of tactics in this position. I'm not really looking for capturing sequences or checks, captures, and threats. I'm more looking for strategic ideas that later will give me some good pressure on his position. 
So this is not a very tactical position. Um, I would say it's um, a fairly strategic position. It's a fairly dynamic position. There's a lot of imbalances. I have to figure out what am I trying to do. And once I look at moves, I have to look at what he's going to do. For instance, if I'm going to play my queen to g3 and then h4 or g4 and then h4, you know, what happens if he just, if I do that and then he just puts his knight on h, his, his pawn on h6 and pins my knight on g5 to my queen on h4? Is that helping me or am I just losing my knight getting it pinned to my queen? So I've got to look a couple moves ahead and determine what kind of moves, as Jeremy Silman say, are both feasible and effective. And I've got a lot of candidates here. As I said, I could, you know, double my rooks on the E file by playing like rook to E2 followed by rook AE1. I could play A4. I can play H4. I can play G4. I might be able to play G3. I'm not sure why I'd want to play that, but I could. I could move the bishop on D2. I can move my knight on G5 back to E4 with the idea of going into that weak F6 square. Then I'd have to look if knight e4, what happens if he just plays f5 and allows his rook to, to guard the f6 square and hits my knight. So I've got a lot of things I need to do, and I'm not going to do them. This is not our 20-minute exercise video. This is just a video on thought process. So my process here involves a lot of strategy and figuring out what I need to do. In case you're interested, I think Stockfish10 says my best move is h4, and it says if I make that move, I'm ahead by about three-quarters of a pawn. <clears throat> All right, let's go ahead about another 10 moves. In the game, I played g4. He played knight d8. I played queen g3. He played bishop f6. I played queen f4. He played bishop e7. I played knight e4. He played f5. I played knight g3. He played queen b7, hitting my d5 pawn. I took his pawn on f5. He took my d5 pawn. I attacked his queen with bishop e4. He went back to f7. I went out of the pin with queen to g4. He went out of his pin so his knight and his pawn wouldn't be pinned to his king with king h8. I played bishop h6, pinning the knight to the rook on f8. He took my pawn on f5. I took back with the knight. And he played knight on d8 to e6. All right, so it's my move, and I have to find a move now. What's my process? Well, again, we're going to look at his last move and ask if it's safe. And that's a very complicated question. Is it safe for him to put his knight on e6 from d8? Well, his knight is safe, but I have all kinds of things I can do here. I have all kinds of checks, captures, and threats. So here, this is a little different than the last move. Instead of strategic, this is very tactical. Now I have to very much look at all my checks, captures, and threats. So what are all my checks, captures, and threats? Well, I can play knight takes g7 if I do that. Before he recaptures, he could play queen takes f2 check. I can play bishop takes g7 check first. Um, I can play knight takes e7, taking the bishop, but again, he has queen takes f2 check if I do that. I could play bishop to d5, pinning that knight on <clears throat> e6 to his queen on f7, and the other knight is pinned to the rook on f8. I could play d5, forcing the knight on e6 at some point on e6 sometime to move, and then the bishop on h6 maybe be able to capture the knight on g7, or maybe the knight on f5 can do that. The problem with playing d5 is he can play rook to g8, and if I take the knight, d takes e6, he can play knight takes e6, and even though he's down a knight, he's got a rook on g8, pinning my queen to my king on g1. So it's very, very complicated. Unlike the thought process... In the previous three positions we looked at, this is all about sequences and about calculation and about figuring out which checks, captures, and threats make the most sense. This is a very complicated position. When I was in this position in this game, I took a really long time. And sure, I looked at d5. I looked at knight takes g7. I looked at bishop d5. I looked at knight takes e7. I looked at uh, bishop takes g7 check. And I couldn't really decide if anything was decisive. You know, I looked at lines like <clears throat> d5, rook g8. And here, um, if I turn on stockfish, if I take the knight and he takes back, the best I have is to sacrifice my bishop. He takes and then I can fork him. Well, I didn't see all that. Um... 
I wasn't sure that this was a very good position for me with my queen pinned to my king. So I looked at a lot of these lines, and the computer says the best line, which obviously I couldn't find, was d5. And it says his best line is to play knight takes f5, because if he plays rook g8, I can play bishop g7 check. And now if he plays knight takes g7, I have knight h6 with a fork. If he plays rook takes g7, I can take with the knight and win the exchange. And when he takes with the knight, I can play rook e3 and I'm up the exchange. I didn't see that I could play d5 and on rook g8 then play bishop g7. There's so many permutations here. I mostly looked at d takes e6, but the computer says the right move is bishop takes g7. And he has nothing better than rook takes, knight takes. Knight takes and off the exchange, but I didn't think that was what was going to happen. It was very complicated, a lot of permutations. So what I eventually played was bishop takes g7 check. He played knight takes g7. I still have a lot of moves I can play. I played queen takes g7 check, and the computer doesn't like that move. The computer says I should have played knight takes g7, and now queen takes f2 check is a big mistake because he can't get back his knight. So he has to play queen takes g7, and now queen takes g7, king takes g7. This is actually transposing into the game then. In the game, I saw that I could remove the guard on his bishop on e7, but it was very complicated. Takes, 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 king takes, removal of the guard, but he can counterattack my bishop. And now the best move I have is rook takes e7 check. I tried to remove the guard some more with bishop d7. He played bishop h4, counterattacking f2. I had nothing better than bishop takes c8, bishop takes f2 check, king g2, bishop takes e1, rook. And now I took the pawn. I could have taken the bishop and lost my bishop with a drawn endgame. Instead, I played there, and we had bishops opposite colors. And he attacked my bishop. I guarded it. He, he attacked my rook. I saved it. And with this absolutely dead equal position, we agreed to a draw. Okay, so let's talk about the four positions in, in summary. The first position we looked at was after a3. Here, depending on how much you know about openings, your process was, you know, what are both sides trying to do? What kind of opening can I play? And what kind of opening principles can I follow? The second position we looked at was the end game. And again, the same question was, what are both sides trying to do? And here I'm using a lot of my endgame knowledge in terms of how I can try to win and what are my different methods for trying to save that pawn and try to get a queen, and do any of them work? Then we looked at the third position, which was game move 20 in the Pamojans game. Let me grab that again. Um, All right, we'll move the board back to where it belongs here. Okay, there we are. And let's forward 40 moves. So we looked at this position, and now my process was a very strategic one. Again, we're asking those same questions. What is he trying to do? What am I trying to do? Was his last move safe? Are my candidate moves safe? But here I'm not looking at a lot of checks, captures, and threats. I'm looking at strategically... What's the best, what am I, based on what I'm trying to do and what he's trying to do, what most strategically would fit into that the best? And would that move be safe? And what would he do after that move? So what would he do after that move? And is it safe is always part of the process. But here my process is, involves a lot more strategic thinking. Finally, we looked at the position 10 moves later. Here in this position, and this was that kind of crazy calculation process where we had to go through a whole bunch of capturing sequences, plus we had checks, captures, and threats. We had removal of the guard with d5. <clears throat> we had a whole bunch of ideas that White could play, and here my process was kind of like that pure calculation process. You know, is his last move safe? What are all the things he's threatening? 
Is he threatening my knight on f5? How many times does he have it attacked? Is it really attacked by the knight on g7 because it's pinned to the rook on f8? If I move that knight on f5, can he play queen takes f2 check? How dangerous is that? <clears throat> if I take first, can I stop and play d5 first to remove the guard or do I need to make a capture first? You know, are my checks more forcing than my just my captures? If I go through a sequence, if I play knight takes g7, what are all the moves he could play? After knight takes g7, he could play queen takes f2 check. He can play knight takes g7. Um, those are probably his two main moves. And I have to look at all these things. Each time I look at a move, my process is to go through each of these lines. And I, you know, I, if you want to see me do that, you have to look at an earlier video where I'm either playing out loud against the computer or maybe my 20-minute video. But, you know, it's outside the scope of this video to do all the analysis in this position. We just want to talk about the process, not the content necessarily of the process. We don't want to look at all the moves. We want to tell you about what kind of process I'm going through. Well, in each of these four positions that we did today, we had completely different processes. There were some key ideas that were the same, which is why I talked about those in the earlier video, the essential parts of the process. What are all the things I'm trying to do? What are all the things he's trying to do? Is, is his move last move safe? What is he threatening? What are all my candidate moves? Are my candidate moves safe? If I make this candidate move, what's he going to do and what can I do about it? These are essential parts of all the, the processes. But notice each of these four positions we looked at required those elements, but the checklists were really quite different. I ignored a lot of the checklists that I did in like this kind of analytical positions when I was in like the opening after a3 or when I was in the end game just determining if I could get a queen. We didn't go through the sequences quite the same way. It wasn't necessary or it wasn't helpful. So you can't just use the same process every time. You have these essential elements that are in the processes, but you can't just say my first step is always, you know, is this move safe? My second step is what are all the things this move does? Well, those are two good steps. But if you made a list of like 20 steps, a lot of those steps you would be saying doesn't apply, doesn't apply, doesn't apply. Or you'd say, uh, yes, I want to do this one and not that one. And a lot of the times good players just don't do that. They just look at the position and say, can I queen the pawn or not? Or they look at the position and say, what opening do I, do I want to play in reverse? Or they might get to a position like this and then they have to really roll up their sleeves and say, oh my goodness, look at all the complications here. I need to figure out all the capturing sequences. I have to figure out, do I need to make a capture first? Can I, do I have time to stop and play removal of the guard? If I play removal of the guard with d5 and he counterattacks by putting his rook on the g file, threatening to pin my queen to my king, is that something I want to allow? Is it worthwhile? Do I have the time to do that? Let's look at the sequences. I don't want to just wave my hands and say I can or I can't. I have to actually take 10, 15, 20 minutes and figure this all out and figure out which one is the best. And I tried to do that and I failed. I didn't play the best move. Uh, it was just so complicated that when I looked through all the permutations and I tried to work my way through, I either missed a move or I missed a candidate move or I misevaluated the position, but it's really easy to do. Even grandmasters make mistakes in really complicated positions. So that's what you want to do. Thought process. There is a sort of method to the madness, but it's not as easy as just telling a beginner, here's a basic checklist, memorize it. Later on, when you have it memorized, you don't have to think about it, just do it. It's just not that easy. It's not that kind of thing. A lot of it depends on what kind of position you have and what kind of process you need to go through for that position. Hopefully that's all clear from today's lesson, okay? If you like the video, you can like it. If you would like to subscribe, great. If you tell your friends about the videos, all the better. Thank you very much. We'll see you next time for my YouTube series. This is Dan Heisman. Bye.